Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the township's public briefing on land use boards and affordable housing. As the mayor indicated, my name is Kit Falcon. I'm the township attorney. And with me this evening are Paul Phillips, the township planner, and Ed Buzak, the attorney for the township planning board. Uh, Ed Buzak is a noted attorney throughout the state on matters involving affordable housing. He has represented municipalities and New Jersey legal municipalities before the Supreme Court in these cases and has, uh, <clears throat> has represented numerous municipalities throughout the state. Paul Phillips is an eminent planner, well known also throughout the state, who is thoroughly versed and provides good planning advice to people who are trying to consider how best to go about their affordable housing obligations. Um, at recent meetings of the Township Committee, the subject of land use application approvals and low and moderate income housing were raised. The Township Committee has asked us to make a presentation on these topics in light of the public interest in them and to acquaint people with both the role of the land use boards and the origins of the obligation for municipalities to provide for a reasonable opportunity for the development of low and moderate income housing, as well as uh, an update on where things stand as, the, as a result of the recent decisions that have been made in the courts, and some that we're actually yet awaiting. Um, we'll turn first to the discussion concerning the Planning Board and the Board of Adjustment. Just, we're really gonna hit these topics in <clears throat> generalities. You can really get into the weeds on these topics if you want to, but I think the point tonight is to acquaint people with what those boards do. Um, and from time to time, you know, people have come to meetings of the township committee to complain about approvals that have been granted by the planning board or the board of adjustment and asking that the township committee take action to reverse those approvals or they've asked why the township committee permitted the boards to make the decisions that they did. The primary thing that needs to be understood is that the Township Committee adopts the zoning ordinances upon uh, the provisions that are in the town's master plan developed by the Planning Board. Uh, these ordinances are then implemented by the boards as they consider the applications that come before them. The Township Committee does not have the power to veto approvals once granted or direct how approvals should be dealt with by those boards. With the exception of the fact that the planning board has two members who also sit on the township committee, the boards operate independently under the provisions of the municipal land use law and the ordinances of the township which set forth the particular requirements that are implemented by those boards. Uh, so I will ask um, Ed Buzak to start with a description of the role and responsibilities of the planning board, the next item on your your sheet. Ed? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I, I want to just briefly talk about the, what the Planning Board does, how it's constituted. I'd like to speak about the, ro <coughs> the role of the Planning Board. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. The role of the Planning Board, how it's constituted and created, uh, what it can do and what it can't do. The Planning Board is a statutory board created uh, by the Township Committee uh, by ordinance. It consists of nine members, as Kit said. Two of those members are uh, part of the governing body, the mayor or the mayor's designee is one member. A member of the governing body chosen by the governing body is another member. A third member is an official in the municipality who is not an elected official. And then the rest of the members are uh, citizens of the municipality and they cannot hold another official office in the municipality with some exceptions and I need not go through them uh, at this time. The, the planning board has two primary functions. Uh, the first function uh, is to develop a master plan for the municipality. Uh, as Kit said that master plan is an important document. 
because it creates <clears throat> essentially a vision of the, uh, for the municipality as it develops in the future. Uh, it's important as well because the ordinances that the governing body adopts must implement that master plan, uh, or if they do not implement the master plan, they must set forth in a resolution why they do not uh, follow the master plan. So the master plan is a very important document in the municipality. Once it is created, uh, it then has to be reviewed at least every 10 years. There's a, a process for that review of the master plan, uh, and it's re-examined, uh, its tenants are re-examined, its vision is re-examined, uh, and there's a set of criteria that has to be followed uh, by the planning board in reviewing that master plan. Remember, the governing body does not adopt the master plan. The planning board, as its name suggests, is the one that adopts the master plan itself and creates that vision. The governing body then either implements it or does not implement it through ordinances that they propose and that are adopted. Any ordinance that the township committee <coughs> uh, introduces uh, must be referred to the planning board for its review and its determination as to whether that ordinance is consistent with the master plan or not consistent with the master plan. They then recommend to the governing body any other changes that may be in the ordinance after making the determination as to whether it's consistent or inconsistent. The governing body then votes on the ordinance. If, in fact, the ordinance is inconsistent with the master plan, as I said earlier, the governing body can still adopt the ordinance, but they have to set forth in a resolution the reasons why they are deviating from that master plan that the planning board has adopted. The second primary role of the planning board, and the one that perhaps you're most familiar with, uh, is the review of development applications that are presented by developers uh, or applicants uh, to utilize their properties consistent with the zoning ordinances within the municipality. Uh, the planning board looks at uh, generally two types of applications. Uh, they are A, subdivision applications in which a developer or property owner or an applicant wants to divide land that already exists into more than one other lot, uh, could be several. Uh, the second role of the planning board, the second type of application that they get is known as a site plan application. And in a site plan application, it typically involves uh, one or several consolidated lots uh, and a type of development on that lot, typically not single family homes because single family homes are not subject to site plan approval. It's typically non-residential development or multi-family uh, residential development. In both subdivision reviews and site plan reviews, the planning board uh, must evaluate those applications based upon the contents of the ordinance. If an applicant submits an application that conforms to all of the ordinance requirements, the planning board does not have the discretion to reject that application. And that goes for both subdivisions and site plans. There are times when an applicant will seek a deviation from an ordinance provision. It may be a front yard setback, a side yard setback, a height differential, or some other provision. Uh, the planning board uh, does have the power to grant certain deviations from the ordinance, uh, typically bulk requirements. The Board of Adjustment, <clears throat> which Kit will talk about in a moment, uh, deals with another type of deviation, which is a much more significant deviation. In order for an applicant to obtain approval or variance to uh, deviate from the ordinance requirements, the applicant must meet certain standards. And again, those standards are set forth in the law. These are not discretionary by the planning board. They don't make these things up. 
the law sets forth the standards that have to be met by an applicant. <clears throat> the planning board has the discretion to evaluate the proofs that are submitted in order to attempt, uh, for a developer or an applicant, to attempt to achieve that variance. But in the end, if the applicant meets that criteria, the applicant is entitled to obtain uh, that variance. There are certain other uh, activities that a planning board engages in. Uh, they are sometimes called upon, uh, as I said, to review ordinances that are introduced by the governing body. There may be other uh, provisions in the ordinances that delegate certain powers to the, or certain review powers to the planning board, uh, but their main uh, and primary goals are to grant or deny site plan applications and subdivision applications and to create a master plan. Okay. That's it. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about <clears throat> the role and, <clears throat> excuse me, responsibilities of the Board of Adjustment. It was realized when zoning was first introduced into government, which isn't really all that long ago, it's less than 100 years ago, whereby different kinds of uses would be allowed to develop in different parts of a community. Until that time, you could put up a factory next to a house, you could do whatever you wanted to do as a property owner, but the laws of zoning said, no, we're gonna have industry over here, we're gonna have a commercial area over here, we're gonna have residential areas over here, and <clears throat> it, it was recognized early on that although zoning ordinances would prescribe very particular standards, you know, a building had to be a certain, uh, could not exceed a certain height, had to be a certain distance from the street, had to have certain side yards which were measurable. Uh, let's say, for example, a, a house couldn't be closer than 40 feet from the sideline of the lot. That there would be exceptional circumstances that from time to time presented themselves where it would be a hardship on a property owner uh, not to be able to develop their property. And accordingly, the variance procedure that Ed has just mentioned was developed, whereby relief could be given to the property owner. The, the standard example is, here's a lot. The zoning ordinance says that a residence built on this lot has to be uh, 60 feet from the street. But it happens that in this particular lot, to the rear, there's a dip or a cliff, which really prohibits development toward the rear of the lot. So a variance is applied for, and when the applicant uh, establishes entitlement to the relief, based upon a couple of standards that I won't bother to take you through, uh, perhaps uh, the applicant is allowed to build the house closer to the road than is otherwise provided in the zoning ordinance, so as to be relieved of the, of the hardship that is created by the particular topography on the lot. So the Board of Adjustment really came in as a kind of a safety valve to deal with extraordinary or exceptional circumstances that just didn't fit the particular regimen that was in the ordinance. Um, the, the role of the Planning Board and their, their particular functions, uh, I'll go through pretty quickly. Um, first, the Board of Adjustment has the right to hear and decide appeals from the administrative officer. Someone comes in to obtain a zoning permit or a building permit to <clears throat> build something and the, and the zoning officer says, well, I'm sorry, I, I, you can't get a permit for that because it doesn't meet the requirements of the ordinance based on the zoning officer's interpretation. The applicant says, well, gee, I really think that it does meet the requirements of the ordinance. And when the zoning officer uh, denies th that permit, then the owner has the right to go to the Board of Adjustment and say, hey, I think you ought to overrule this administrative officer because I don't think he or she is interpreting this correctly. So that's the first role, to, to hear and decide appeals from decisions by administrative officers. The second thing is not unlike it to interpret what the zoning ordinance means. Um, 
believe it or not, the, these ordinances are sometimes convoluted or not easily understood, and, and it falls to the Board of Adjustment then to be the board as between the two that interprets what they mean. Bulk variances that Ed mentioned and that I mentioned with respect to the example of the house too close to the street mean distance, height, bulk kind of requirements. How far do you have to be away from the street? How tall can the building be? What kind of a backyard do you have to have? And then variances can be granted from those requirements where a case is established. But the big uh, power that the Board of Adjustment has that no other board has is the right to grant what's called a D variance because it's section D in the statute, which means it can permit a use or a structure in a zone in a district which restricts that kind of use or structure. It's not easily obtained. There are extensive proofs that have to be put in in order for one to be entitled to build something that is not ordinarily permitted in that zone. But that's the role of the Board of Adjustment, which requires um, <clears throat> extraordinary proofs. And has an additional requirement that you must get five votes in favor of a D variance, not simply a majority of the, the, the quorum of the board, but you have to get, in every instance where a, a D variance is being considered, five affirmative votes. Um, the other two are the variances for permitted density or height of a structure where someone is coming in and proposes to build a structure which is either 10 feet over the required height or 10% uh, of the, more than the maximum height. Um, where the Board of Adjustment has made a decision and people have come and have objected and put a case in, or for that matter, people need not have come to the hearings but have become interested in it for one reason or another, they are able to appeal the decision of the Board of Adjustment to the Superior Court of New Jersey for a judge to determine whether or not the board followed the rules that they are supposed to file, uh, follow, that they are, they're obliged to um, conform to the standards that Ed mentioned in making their decisions, and if not, then the court can overturn the denial or can, uh, can overturn the, uh, the grant, for example, and reverse the decision of the Board of Adjustment. So um, the final task of the Board of Adjustment, which is really very useful to the Township Committee, is that the Board of Adjustment is obliged to prepare a report uh, annually, which it sends to the governing body, which says essentially, you know, we've been getting a lot of variances for side yard uh, bulk requirements in a certain zone and and we've been granting them all because we think they ought to be granted we would really like you to think about changing the ordinance there's no sense us going through this variance procedure every time it just makes sense why don't you change the ordinance to make what we're granting acceptable so that the ordinance is revised and the number of applications that have been going to the board of adjustment for this thing can be alleviated. Um, the only thing in addition that I want to say is that with respect to this planning board and the Board of Adjustment, there are communities that have put this all in one board, one land use board, a joint board, where they exercise the powers of, of both boards. But that's not the situation in Melbourne, and hopefully we have informed you in a kind of a general superficial way what the roles of these boards are subdivisions and site plans, and variances from the requirements of the ordinance in the case of the Board of Adjustment. Now, I'm going to turn to the township planner to ask him if he would uh, begin to discuss some of the planning criteria that go into the granting of relief by these boards. Thank you, Kit, and good evening. So I guess as the planner on the panel, uh, my job this evening is to give a brief description of the uh, planning standards that would allow an applicant before uh, either the planning board or the zoning board to obtain variance relief. Uh, and as Kit mentioned, there's two types of variances uh, in New Jersey. They flow from the state's municipal land use uh, law, 
which is the enabling statute. They're known as either D variances or C variances. D variances are generally characterized as being use variances, and I'll go through them briefly. C variances are generally characterized as being bulk uh, type variances, and I'll also give you just some brief uh, examples. All D variances go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. C variances go to the Zoning Board of Adjustment where there's no site plan approval being sought in connection with the C variance. If there is site plan approval being sought and there's a C variance as part of the application, that goes to the uh, Planning Board. Now the D variances, the use variances, uh, there are essentially six of those type variances under the Municipal Land Use Statute. Uh, there's your classic use variances as Kit described. That basically is you're applying for to build a use that's not permitted within the district. Uh, the second type of uh, D variance is an expansion of a non-conforming use. You, there's an existing building or development, uh, but the underlying zoning doesn't permit it. You want to expand it. You need a D variance. There are also D variances associated with uh, certain um, uh, height variances. Uh, if you exceed 10% of what the standard is for height or 10 feet, that rises to the level of a D variance. There's something called a density D variance. That has to do with residential development, where if the underlying zone permits a certain density, let's say five units per acre, and the applicant is proposing seven units per acre, that rises to a D variance. There's also a floor area ratio variance, which typically relates to non-residential use. That has to do with how much of the site you're proposing to build on. And then there is the last uh, of the six D variances, the conditional use variance. Certain uses are set up as conditional use, uh, where if you meet certain conditions, the use is permitted and you go to the planning board, but if you don't meet one or more of the conditions, it rises to the level of a D variance. All D variances have a higher standard of proof than C variances, uh, and as Kit mentioned, uh, they also require uh, five affirmative votes of the Zoning Board of Adjustment out of seven members. And if an applicant goes to a hearing and decides to take a vote, and there are five members there, that applicant needs all five members. So it's five affirmative votes, no matter how many of the board basically shows up if a vote is taken that uh, evening. Uh, the D variance proofs are uh, basically uh, set forth by both the statute and case law. An applicant has to demonstrate what's known as special reasons. There has to be special reasons as to why an applicant is entitled to a D uh, variance, and this particularly goes to the D1 use variance. An applicant for a use variance also has to demonstrate that the site is particularly suitable for the use uh, and also has to reconcile the fact that the underlying zoning doesn't contemplate the use at the particular location. So it's a very high burden uh, of proof for a use variance. Uh, and there is one type of use variance that has a lesser burden. It's known as an inherently beneficial use. The burden is not as great, and inherently beneficial use or uses that are can, uh, characterized as basically, by their very nature, promoting the public welfare. A hospital, a school, are examples of an inherently beneficial uh, use. Any use variance also has to satisfy what's known as the negative criteria. There has to be a, a showing, uh, and certainly there has to be convincing evidence to the board that the granting of the variance would not cause substantial detriment to the public good, which in many cases uh, has to do with surrounding properties, neighboring properties, and also that there will be no substantial impairment of the zone plan uh, or master plan. So it's a fairly heavy uh, burden of proof. The C bulk variances have a lesser burden of proof. They require just a simple majority of the board. There's no enhanced affirmative uh, requirement in terms of the, of the number of votes. Uh, typical bulk variances would be things such as uh, you don't meet the lot area in the zone. Uh, the, the zone may prescribe, let's say, a 20,000 square foot lot and you only have 10,000 square feet. That's a bulk variance, dimensional requirements. You don't meet the lot width or the lot depth requirements. 
setback requirements. The zone may prescribe a front yard setback of 50 feet and an applicant's only seeking 30 feet. Coverage, uh, both building coverage and impervious lot coverage. These are typical C or bulk variances and the lesser height standard, uh, not meeting that threshold that I indicated for D variance also would fall under the bulk or C variance uh, category. And there's two standards of proof basically for a C variance. They're known as C1 and C2, again relating to the sections of the enabling statute. The C1 is your classic, there's some type of hardship or unique uh, conditions affecting a particular piece of property. Uh, due to its shape, you can't meet the setback requirement. Due to topography, there's steep topography in the rear of this, in the front of the site. In the rear of the site, you have to push everything up front. You don't meet the front yard. These are setback point. These are examples of uh, types of uh, planning uh, standards that would allow a board to grant a um, a. Uh, a C variance under hardship criteria, some type of unusual or peculiar situation or condition affecting a particular piece of property. And then uh, lastly, there's what's known as the C2, which we refer to as a flexible C variance. The uh, legislature some time ago recognized that there's a basis to grant these variances even in cases where there is not hardship. So if an applicant can basically demonstrate that the benefits of granting the variance in a particular situation outweigh the uh, detriments, then there's a basis to grant that relief. And an applicant must also show that one or more purposes of the enabling statute would be advanced. And also, as with any variance, an applicant for C2 variance would have to uh, satisfy, again, the negative criteria. No substantial detriment to the public good and no substantial impairment of the zone plan or zoning uh, ordinance. So I think that gives you some flavor for uh, the types of variances and the standard of proof uh, that applicants must demonstrate in order uh, to be entitled and in order for a board to grant that relief. Thank you. So for those of you who are still awake, <laughs> listening to uh, that rendition about what these boards do, but it is, important uh, as i said when i started people come to the the governing body and they want to understand what it is that these land use boards do and what they can do and that uh, was kind of a thumbnail sketch uh, of what the respective roles of these boards are and what some of the rules are that they have to apply in order to grant relief uh, i'm going to move on now to i think what most people are here to hear about which is affordable housing. <clears throat> um, I hope you'll bear with me. I've written all of this down, so I'm going to refer to these notes uh, to a great extent because I've really compressed this topic. My part of this is to talk about the judicial origins, the uh, background of the public policy, exclusionary zoning, Mount Laurel 1, Mount Laurel 2, and then eventually the adoption of the Fair Housing Act in 1985. There's a long history to this. And <clears throat> we also recognize affordable housing is not something people walk around thinking about. It's not really in the mix most of the time. Uh, and unfortunately, by its nature, it often descends abruptly upon a municipality, uh, leaving everybody to kind of scramble to understand what in the world is going on here. Uh, I hope that we're going to be able to lay this out in an intelligible way for you, in an understandable way, so that uh, we can all leave here tonight uh, feeling that we've gotten at least a, an elementary understanding of what this affordable housing situation in New Jersey is all about. Um, I'm going to discuss the origins of New Jersey's low and moderate income housing requirements starting with the decisions of the New Jersey Supreme Court and leading up, as I said, to the adoption by the legislature of the Fair Housing Act. I'll then ask my colleagues to continue this briefing by explaining the development by the Council on Affordable Housing, that's COA, that outfit you hear about all the time, currently out of business, uh, of low and moderate income housing standards and its implementation of what are commonly known as the round one and round two requirements. 
Finally, they will address the prolonged commotion associated with the failed attempts by COA to establish round three requirements leading to the March 2015 decision of the New Jersey Supreme Court in which uh, Ed argued the case on behalf of the New Jersey League of Municipalities, uh, which returned the issue to the judiciary of the state for resolution. Finally, I'll invite questions from the audience. I ought to make clear at this point that we're not going to discuss any matter that's currently before a land use board of Milburn Township, nor will we speculate on issues related to Milburn Township's obligations concerning low and moderate income housing uh, standards. Firstly, because there's considerable uncertainty as to how this is all going to end up, uh, but secondly, as a, a practical matter, uh, the Township Committee, if, when they make uh, determines with re determinations with respect to it, uh, those are the people you should hear from, not from the staff or uh, their consultants. Um, I'll attempt to summarize the philosophical and judicial underpinnings of the current public policy in the state of New Jersey, which fosters the construction of low and moderate income housing. Everyone knows what zoning is. We've been talking about that. It's the creation of land use regulations, which in its most understandable sense allocates to different areas of the municipality different type of uses. In 1926, the United States Supreme Court, in the case of Euclid versus Ambler, ruled that the power to implement zoning ordinances was inherent in the local government's police power to promote the public health, safety, morals, general welfare. New Jersey followed suit in 1927 when the legislature ratified an amendment to the New Jersey Constitution that gave the legislature the power to authorize municipalities to enact zoning ordinances, which is what Milburn has done. Over the next several decades, a point of view emerged among housing advocates that the power to zone was being utilized by municipalities not only to locate compatible types of land uses in different areas within those municipalities, but also as an exclusionary technique designed to prevent low-income individuals from living in certain municipalities because those individuals could not afford to build or live in housing that met the zoning requirements. This was generally said to be accomplished by the zoning of large vacant parcels solely for industrial and commercial uses, as well as the creation of zoning requirements which led exclusively to the construction of more spacious uh, or desirable homes on large lots within the municipality. That was the housing advocate's take on what was happening with respect to municipal zoning in New Jersey. Now this philosophy found its official voice in an opinion of the New Jersey Supreme Court in 1975, now called Mount Laurel One. The legal question before the court centered on whether it was lawful for a municipality to use zoning ordinances as a means of preventing people from living within that municipality based on the limited extent of their income. The court held that every municipality's zoning scheme must provide a variety and choice of housing so as to afford low and moderate income persons a realistic opportunity to reside in each municipality. The court sought to enable developers through land use ordinances to have a realistic opportunity to provide a fair share of low and moderate income housing. Now, as a practical matter, the announcement of this judicial doctrine did not, in the ensuing years, lead to the construction of such housing to any significant degree. Simply put, developers were interested in developing upscale housing, which they regarded as meeting the desires of the market and the requirements of the public. This was especially true in the outward expanding suburban areas which were being newly developed. Then along came Mount Laurel II in 1983. The court stated that it was determined to make the Mount Laurel doctrine work. The court explained, unless a strong judicial hand is used, Mount Laurel will not result in housing, but in trials and appeals. We intend by this decision to clarify it and make it easier 
for public officials to apply it, whereupon decades of trials and appeals <laughs> occurred. <laughs> First, the court held that every municipality must provide its fair share of the region's present and prospective need for affordable housing. Next, the court ruled that all municipalities should provide a realistic opportunity for the construction of decent housing for residents currently living in decrepit housing. The court stated that a municipality must express its affordable housing obligation using specific numbers. The court explained that the Mount Laurel obligation could only be satisfied, quote, if the municipality has in fact provided a realistic opportunity for the construction of its fair share of low and moderate income housing. Notice there now, it didn't say the municipality has to build such housing. It said it has to make, <clears throat> uh, through its zoning ordinances, a reasonable opportunity for such housing to be built. Significantly, the court implemented a builder's remedy, which allows developers to obtain court approval for a project to build low or moderate income housing, even if the town has not approved the plan. This created an incentive for developers to take municipalities to court in the hopes that by providing affordable housing in their developments, they can override municipal zoning restrictions. What that means is that the builder comes to a community which has not satisfied its affordable housing obligations. Then goes to court and says, judge, they have not satisfied their obligation, but I will build a project which is admittedly larger and more extensive and intense than their zoning permits but I'll build into it an affordable housing component so that there will be affordable housing within this larger project. The court typically uh, appoints a standing master, a special master who oversees this whole business and who acts in place of the normal zoning power of the municipality. Uh, Interestingly enough, although it's, it's kind of an odd coincidence, <clears throat> Gail Frazier, who's the Board of Adjustment Attorney in Milburn, and Ed and Paul and I all represent Morris Plains. I'm the Planning Board Attorney there. Ed's the Affordable Housing Attorney. <clears throat> Paul's the Planner. And we are just now concluding, we hope, uh, a number of years of negotiations over an affordable, uh, a builder's remedy lawsuit where the builder came in and suggested, if I remember correctly, it was 800 units yes. to begin with. <clears throat> 800 units in the borough of Morris Plains because Morris, Morris Plains had not met its affordable housing obligations. Now we've been able, I won't be able to talk specifics, we've been able to uh, negotiate that number down and uh, it's going to be more acceptable to the uh, borough than where we all started out, but I, what I'm trying to do is give you a concrete example of just one of many, many, many such cases that have come to bear throughout the state of New Jersey where municipalities who had not met their obligations are all of a sudden confronted by builders who take them to court uh, in these uh, builders remedy lawsuits that I mentioned in order to force uh, the development of projects which will assist the municipalities in meeting their obligations. So, in 1985, in response to the decision in the Mount Laurel II decision that I just described to you, and growing pressures from municipalities to create a way for towns to meet their Mount Laurel obligations outside of the court system, the New Jersey legislature enacted the Fair Housing Act. This act established COA, the agency responsible for developing the state's affordable housing plans uh, and ensuring the towns complied with the Mount Laurel Doctrine. COA's duties, as enumerated in the act, included estimating the present and prospective need for affordable housing, establishing criteria and guidelines for computing every municipality's fair share number. 
ACOA adopted sets of rules known as first round rules, second round rules, and third round rules. Suits challenging COA's regulations under the first and second round rules brought by both municipalities and housing advocates were generally unsuccessful. COA's third round rules, on the other hand, have been struck down twice by the appellate division of the Superior Court due to COA's inability to produce acceptable supporting data for its methodology. At this juncture, Relating to the highly litigated challenges to the third round rules and the recent Supreme Court case to which I referred, I'll turn to Ed Buzak, one of the key players in that litigation, and Paul Phillips, who has represented numerous municipalities in connection with those housing issues to further describe what transpired from that point forward. Uh, thank you, Kit. <clears throat> uh, when COA uh, was created, uh, it had two primary functions. Uh, the first function was to develop regulations that would uh, establish a thread that has run through all of the regulations, and that is the quantification of the need, the affordable housing need in the state, in the region, and then in the individual municipalities. And just as important, regulations dealing with the allocation of that obligation throughout the 500 now six, and 65 municipalities within the state. The second function of COA <clears throat> was to uh, administer a process by which municipalities that, as Kit said, wanted to satisfy this constitutional obligation could do so in a manner that did not involve the judicial system, that did not involve the courts, that they could step up to the plate, essentially, control their own dense, uh, destiny, and develop a plan, a realistic plan, that would create the opportunity for the eventual construction of their fair share of the region's low and moderate income housing needs. Uh, so for the first time in 1985, municipalities had an opportunity to affirmatively go forward on their own, on their own terms, so to speak, and develop a plan that they felt would satisfy the obligation. Uh, looking first to the regulations, as Kit said, COA has adopted several rounds of regulations. Their first round covered the period between 1987 and 1993. COA was created in 1985 under the Fair Housing Act by the time it got its act together and developed regulations. It was 1987 when they actually went into effect. And they ran for a six-year period of time, which at that time <clears throat> was uh, coincident with the six-year period of the validity of a master plan. I said to you earlier that a planning board has to look at its master plan every 10 years and has to re-examine the plan. <clears throat> Back when COA was created, that 10-year window was a six-year window. So COA's regulations dovetailed with the municipal land use laws provisions regarding master plans because obviously the creation of a realistic opportunity for the construction of affordable housing is a key component of the master plan of any municipality. <clears throat> uh, as I said, the thread that runs through all of these regulations is the quantification of the need. What is that need? What is the affordable housing need in the state of New Jersey? And then have that devolve to the regions and to the individual municipalities. And then how do you allocate that need among the municipalities? Who gets what? What are the numbers, so to speak, that each municipality has to meet in order to satisfy its constitutional obligation? <clears throat> in addition to that, there was another component that COA regulations in the first round and actually all through uh, their rounds uh, involved, and that is substandard housing uh, that lacked certain uh, 
uh, uh, criteria. If it lacked plumbing, if it lacked heating, if, there were, if it was overcrowded, those substandard units that currently existed within a municipality occupied by low and moderate income families had to be rehabilitated in some way and municipalities were charged with implementing programs that would enable those low and moderate income families occupying those substandard units to rehabilitate them up to code standards. Uh, the other component besides the what they called indigenous need, the need that existed in the municipality, uh, was the prospective need. That is, how much affordable housing would have to be built over the next six years to satisfy the low and moderate income population that would develop over that six year period. Now, just saying it and you're thinking about that uh, highlights the challenges inherent in that process. How do you know that? You need to project what the population is going to be over the next six years. You need to project how many households are going to be created out of that increased population. You then need to determine how many of those households will be low and moderate income households, and then how that is going to be satisfied. All of that is speculation. Now, numbers were just not made up. There's data that exists, particularly census data, that's gotten more and more sophisticated over the years that enable people like Paul Phillips and planners uh, and demographers and other experts to develop methodologies in order to make that projection. But remember, it's a projection. No one knows what's going to happen. No one knew in 1987 what was going to happen over the next six years, but they made projections as to what that number would be, the number of low and moderate income, income households that would be created over that time period, and then took that number, allocated it to regions. There were six regions created in the state. Milburn is in region two. That region in 1987 consisted of Sussex, Union, Morris and Essex counties. Uh, that number, the statewide number, was broken down to regions, so Milburn had part of that four county region. That region had a number, and then that number was allocated among the municipalities within that four county region. Uh, the mechanism that was utilized to allocate it was again not simply picked out of the air. There was a formula that was created that attempted to account for a municipality's responsibility for that expected growth and their capacity to absorb that prospective growth. And those nice words, those, those ambiguous words of responsibility and capacity were then honed into actual data points. And those data points consisted of uh, looking at the annual income, for example, of a municipality within that region as compared to the region's annual income. Uh, it, looked at the number of jobs, employment, that was existent within the municipality as compared to the employment within the region. It looked at the change in that employment over the last 10-year period of the municipality's job situation versus the region's job situation. And lastly, it looked at the available, developable land in the municipality as compared to the municipalities in the region. And it took those ratios and applied those to that general number 
of units that the region had to absorb. And that municipality got what was known as its fair share of the region's low and moderate income housing needs. And those were the criteria <clears throat> in very general form that were utilized to make those allocations. <clears throat> Round one ended in 1993, and COA set about to develop second round regulations. And they utilized the same, many of the same criteria that they utilized in the first round, but they made an important and critical decision that affects all municipalities, particularly Milburn, but all municipalities in the state, by saying that your obligation is cumulative. So therefore, when you were allocated a number from 1987 to 1993, that number was then added to the obligation that they projected from 1993 to 1999. So if you did nothing from 1987 to 1993, that obligation did not go away. That obligation remained and effectively was added to the next round's obligation. And that was a critical decision because, remember, we started this in 1987. <clears throat> We're now in 2017. So there's a huge accumulation of obligations that municipalities have in this state. And the number doesn't grow exponentially, but it grows relatively quickly. <clears throat> in the second round, uh, COA utilized essentially the same process that it utilized in the first round. There were some minor changes that we need not get into, uh, but it created a combined number of first round and second round. In 1999, when COA set about to create its third round, it started to get the hang of this a little bit, and I think began to realize that this process may not work as you go forward over and over and over again, and that the projections of growth were not accurate, because now in 1993, they can look back at what they thought in, was going to happen in 1987 and see how close they were. Well, it turned out when they looked in 1993, their projections were significantly off. They had overestimated the population growth, the household growth, the number of low and moderate income households that would be created during that time period, and therefore municipalities were allocated a number that really was in excess of what their obligation should have been. Uh, they did adjust that when they did the second round, um, but and, and utilized, however, the same general formulation to get to the second round. When you got to the third round, they said, you know, this is this still doesn't seem to be right because we're still off here. So let's scrap that whole concept of trying to project what's going to happen, because we see there's inherent difficulties with that. And instead, let's go to a different system. And the system was known as growth share. And what the system generally said was that rather than establishing a number based upon a projection, will simply require a municipality to provide a realistic opportunity for a number of units as it grows. So what they did was, and again, I won't go, it was a much more sophisticated methodology that I'm about to explain to you, but the end result of it was, let's create a formula whereby a municipality that had 10 residential units constructed, that one of those 10, one in 10, should be an affordable unit. And since low and moderate income families worked in employment centers in municipalities, in, in, in commercial areas within municipalities, let's also create an obligation that for every 25 jobs, that are created, the municipality has one affordable housing obligation. So if a municipality did not grow, if there was no residential growth in the municipality, 
it would not have an affordable housing obligation under that criteria. And if there were no jobs created over that, now it got to a 10-year period, there would be no affordable housing obligation because the projection for that municipality and the reality of that municipality would be there would be no growth. There'd be no population growth. There'd be no job growth. So therefore, there's no prospective need. You still had the 87 to 99 obligation, but you wouldn't have a prospective need. That made some sense in the scheme of things, but when COA adopted those regulations, which took them five years to develop, so we got from 99 to 2004, they adopted the regulations that I've just outlined in 2004, and they were immediately challenged. In 2007, three years later, so now we're past, we're almost up to the 10-year period that this round was supposed to accommodate, uh, the regulations were overturned by the appellate division of the Superior Court. And the court sent the case back to COA and said, while you can use growth share, you need to establish a number. As Kit Falcon said at the beginning when he was talking about Mount Laurel II, one of the tenets was that you need to establish a number. A numberless system doesn't work. <clears throat> so in 2007, the appellate division said, that's what you've created here. You've created a numberless system. Municipality has no obligation unless it grows in jobs or in residential construction. So we're going to send it back to COA, and you need to refine this. Well, when you think about the concept for a second, those two uh, concepts, the concept of establishing a number versus a growth share methodology, are completely inconsistent with each other. Either you have a number and you meet it, or you don't have a number and you build as you grow, so to speak. So the appellate division's direction to COA was really, in my view, nonsensical. It, it was completely inconsistent. However, COA, because it was directed by the court to do so, established a growth share system that had a target number. Uh, so you can see where this is going, I'm sure. Uh, so now municipalities had a target number. They had to zone to meet this target number, but yet their obligation was then really established by the amount of growth that took place. And you have to scratch your head a little bit when you listen to that, because you may, if you're listening, if you're still awake, uh, may think that doesn't make sense, and the reality is it didn't make sense. But COA did it anyway because they were directed to do it because the court said they had to do it. Sure enough, they adopted the regulations in 2008, about a year later, and they were immediately challenged. Two years later in 2010, now we're 11 years after the third round was supposed to be adopted. In 2010, the appellate division, different, different group of judges but the same level of court, made the same determination that the court made in 2007. They said, no, this growth share doesn't work. It's invalid. You've still given municipalities too much leeway. There's not solid numbers that they have to meet. But you know what? Maybe that numberless system that the court established in 1983, <clears throat> almost 20 years before that, maybe that needs to be reexamined by the Supreme Court. Well, the appellate division can't reexamine it because it's a lower level court. But the judge, to his credit, put that in his opinion and encouraged the court, the Supreme Court, to perhaps reconsider this. Uh, petitions were filed with the Supreme Court, and it went up to the Supreme Court. They took the case, and they decided, no, what we're going to do is this. This growth share just is too complicated for us. It doesn't work. We want you to go back to the first and second round. Go back to what you did in 1987 and 1993 and make these projections. We already know that those projections, uh, you know, are, are just that. They're projections. It's speculation based upon evidence, but, you know, that evidence is current evidence. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. No one predicted the 2008 crash. 
No one predicted the crashes in the late 80s and early 90s in the housing market. <clears throat> so in any event, in 2013, the Supreme Court said to COA, we're going to send it back to you again, but you can't use growth share. You have to go back to the old methodology. So COA then set about to try to develop the old methodology, bring it forward to 2013 and 2014. Court gave them six months to do it. It didn't work. COA went back, got an extension for five months, I think. It still didn't work. Uh, finally, the court said, we're going to give you a final deadline. And the final deadline is November of 2014. 2014. You need to have these regulations in place. If you don't, there's no telling what we're going to do. But we may take this back. So COA puts its nose to the grindstone, comes up with regulations, meets these interim goals. They even get the regulations proposed early. And on October 17th of 2014, they have them on the table ready for adoption. A couple of problems exist. COA consists of 12 members, an odd number for a regulatory board because it's an even number. Typically, you have an odd number so you don't have deadlocks. That didn't seem to bother the legislature when they created COA, so they created a 12-member board. Unfortunately, because at that time the governor had not nominated people to fill expiring terms, COA consisted of six members, not 12 members. So we're down to six, and under their bylaws, they could operate with six. <clears throat> but, of course, six is as bad as 12 because it's an even number. And the first motion was made to table these regulations because they had just been finalized a couple weeks before. Some of the members felt they didn't have enough time to really digest them, so they wanted to postpone it. Uh, that motion was seconded, and uh, it did not pass. The vote was three to three. So the other side says, OK, since we're not going to postpone it, we're going to move to adopt. Well, guess what? That motion failed, three to three. COA promptly adjourned the meeting and have not been heard from since. In the meantime, the housing advocates, having seen that, brought a motion before the Supreme Court and said, look, they're not acting. I mean, they tried. We don't like the regulations anyway, but that's another story. But they didn't do it, and you have to do something. So in 2015, in what's known as either Mount Laurel 4 or Mount Laurel 3, depending upon how you count these things, uh, the Supreme Court said, we're done. COA is an inoperative agency. It's dysfunctional. It's not working. And we are now going to take this back. At the time, there were 300 ap over 300 applications that, that were pending before COA through this administrative process that I talked about when COA was created, where municipalities stepped up to the plate, developed plans to attempt to satisfy their obligation. Now, of course, they knew what their obligation was between 87 and 99. Those numbers had been established. But between 1999 and now 2015, there were no regulations. So they didn't know what their obligations were. So they were shooting in the dark. People like Paul Phillips were tasked with developing plans that would satisfy an obligation that no one knew uh, what it was. <clears throat> Nonetheless, there were over 300 applications before COA pending the adoption of these regulations, which were never adopted. So the Supreme Court said, okay, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give those 300 municipalities the ability to come back to court, to take what they had before COA and simply transfer it to a process known as a declaratory judgment action. We're going to give those municipalities a deadline, deadline was July 8th of 2015, to file declaratory judgment actions. And if they file declaratory judgment actions and effectively transfer their plans to the court, 
<clears throat> we will then process those plans. Not a bad idea, but we still have the problem of what's the number? What's the obligation? How do you process a plan when you don't know what the obligation is? <clears throat> uh, that didn't seem to bother the court, the Supreme Court. They said, we're going to send this back to the trial <clears throat> courts. Everyone filed their declaratory judgment actions in the counties in which they're located. So Milburn files in Essex if they were filing, etc. And uh, we'll have the trial judges try to figure this out as to what the methodology is. Well, you have to look at that and say to yourself, that's not going to work. Uh, because first of all, you have 21 counties. You have 15 vicinages. Vicinages are judicial entities, uh, some of several counties. Uh, and each of those vicinages had a Mount Laurel judge from back in the old days. And uh, those 15 Mount Laurel judges would take these cases, depending upon which county they were in, and they would have to develop a methodology because no one else was developing a methodology. Well, you could have 15 different methodologies. Well, how do you have methodologies projecting what the statewide obligation is when you're dealing with only a small area of that? And if one judge said this is what the number should be, based upon a statewide number. Another judge could say, well, I don't, I don't buy that methodology. Is it that methodology is defective? Well, that's the system that we're in right now. There are over 250, close to 300, declaratory judgment actions that are pending throughout the state in 15 vicinages in 21 counties. And there's no methodology that has been developed, except for one. One case in Middlesex County went forward, and the court accepted the methodology that allegedly was based upon the first and second rounds that was advocated by a housing group known as Fair Share Housing Center. They put their experts on. The judge in that case determined that that methodology was the one that was going to be followed and established that number for, it turned out to be a single municipality in Middlesex County. The next judge to handle a case was down in Ocean County. Uh, that took up three different counties, but it was one judge who was handling the Ocean County case. He went to trial, we had, I was involved in that trial, we went through one day of a trial and all the municipalities in Ocean County that had filed declaratory judgment actions settled their cases. So there was now no number from Ocean County. Then went over to Mercer County and we started that case. We represented, I along with another attorney represented five municipalities in Mercer County <clears throat> that were the five remaining municipalities that had not settled their cases, and we tried the methodology case in full. Uh, the case took 41 trial days. We started in January, we ended in June. We are still awaiting a decision from the judge. Uh, with 41 trial days, the, the amount of information that was put on the record was extensive and the judge is wading through that along with an expert that the court hired, strike that, that the court appointed that the municipalities had to pay for <clears throat> to assist the court in trying to come up with a methodology based upon the evidence that was presented. That decision we thought would be coming out in September, we thought it would be coming out in October, we hope it's coming out in November, but we think that it's probably coming out in December. But that, that will be the second case that will establish some type of methodology that may be utilized by other judges throughout the state, including the Essex County judge, who has been awaiting this decision to see where it takes everyone. So uh, that is where we are now. Uh, there's no uniform methodology that's been created. Uh, we're awaiting a decision in Mercer County. And for Essex County, Morris County, <coughs> um, 
Warren, I'm sorry, uh, yes, Warren and Union counties, those four counties that make up of which, of which Milburn is a part, there's been no decision made. So we don't know what that number is. However, the three experts, there's an expert for the municipalities that have been hired by over 200 municipalities to come up with a methodology. They have a number. There's a number that Fair Share Housing Center, the housing advocates have, that applies to the 565 municipalities. They have a number. And then this court-appointed special master, who the judge in Mercer County appointed, is also the special master in a number of other counties, including Essex County and Morris County. And I'm not sure he's in Union County. I don't think he is. Uh, he's got a number because he's listened to this testimony and he's come up with a methodology, and he's got a number. And just as an order of magnitude, the housing advocates number is high. The municipalities advocates number is low. And the special master's number is in between those numbers. Uh, and you know, we, can, we can talk about this for the rest of the night, but you've already fallen asleep, so I'm going to pass it on <laughs> to Paul to hopefully wake you up. Yep. So by, uh, by a show of hands, how many of your heads are spinning at this point? <laughs> Even my head's spinning. <laughs> so, so when I said earlier the number has been <laughs> floating, you know that Ed took that from <clears throat> 1983 to the present moment, and it's, it's the most calamitous tale of government ineptitude that uh, I think but one could uh, so here, here's what we know. We know that the Supreme Court way back when and the state Supreme Court basically ruled that every municipality in the state has a constitutional obligation to provide a realistic opportunity to meet its fair share housing obligation, whatever that fair share number is. And the way to demonstrate that you can meet the fair share housing obligation, as Ed so eloquently put, is to basically prepare a plan. And this is normally done uh, by a municipality preparing what's known as a housing element and fair share plan. It's basically the municipality's um, uh, avenue of indicating how it's going to meet that particular number. The problem also, as Ed aptly pointed out, is um, the real difficulty is how do you begin to think about preparing a plan when you don't have any clue as to what the, the number is. The, the one thing that the three experts actually agree on, because Ed, the Supreme Court said they had to, to agree on it, was the prior round number. And that was from the 1987 to 1999 period. There's no uh, dispute amongst the three experts that Ed cited in the Mercer County case. Uh, there's no dispute because that number comes out of the COA second round rules, and everybody agrees to that number. But that's the easy part, and that's typically not a huge number for municipalities to meet. The problem is what ultimately is going to be the number that covers the period from 1999, the point of departure, until uh, 2025. And uh, as Ed has indicated, and I can attest to the three experts in the Mercer County case, uh, the numbers are, they're, they're all over the place in terms of the municipal expert is at a low number, the Fair Share Housing Center is a very high number, and the, the regional numbers master appointed to be the court's expert is somewhere in between. And I think we're going to certainly uh, be able to get a, you know, some indication moving forward of what that number is going to be as it comes out of the uh, out of the Mercer County case. So that's the dilemma. You have this wide disparity in terms of numbers. How do you plan for that? Now, I will say one thing which is probably applicable to Milburn, and that is that under the second round rules, which are the only rules that courts haven't invalidated, there is a process by which a municipality can seek a vacant land adjustment. So even if a municipality basically has a high number, and in some cases they're in the thousands, the, the one municipality that didn't settle in Middlesex County that Ed mentioned, 
that the, the, the number that the judge assigned to that municipality was 2,900 units. 2,900 units. Um, so essentially, a municipality such as Milburn can seek to do something under the rules, uh, which is to calculate its RDP or realistic development potential. And municipalities that have very few vacant land resources can basically do a, uh, an inventory of all the vacant land in the community. Uh, and they get to exclude uh, lands such as municipal parks, county parks, state parks. They get to exclude lands that are environmentally constrained. And they apply a formula in terms of a, what's known as a presumptive density to the vacant land that exists assume there's going to be a 20% set aside for affordable housing and you calculate a number. And very often for developed communities that number is well, well below and only a small percentage of what the actual number assigned is. That's sort of the good news for communities that are developed and don't have significant vacant land resources because they simply, there's no feasible physical way to meet that particular number. So that's the good news. So, sort of the bad news to that is, Ed also mentioned, is the actual number sort of never goes away. So uh, I'm just going to pick out numbers hypothetically. Let's say a municipality has a number of uh, 250 units, okay? And it does a vacant land adjustment, and it shows that it can only provide for 50 of those 250 units. That delta, those 200 units, or something that is, is basically called unmet need. And basically the courts and the fair share housing center is putting an onus on municipalities to do things to show that they're at least trying to provide some opportunity to meet that unmet need. And one of the ways that that's done, and it's probably most often done, is through something called overlay zoning. And overlay zoning is where you don't basically undermine or take away the zoning that's in place, but you put in an opportunity so that if you're going to convert whatever exists on a piece of property within that zone, that there's some opportunity to provide housing in the future on that particular zone. So you might look at, let's say, a non-residential district where there's some underutilized sites or some buildings that aren't in the best condition and say, we're going to keep this zoning, but we're going to provide an opportunity just in case the land use will convert itself, that if it does, there's an opportunity that a developer might be able to do residential. Not required to do residential, but just that that opportunity exists. And by the way, in terms of the number, and I guess I use the example uh, of the 250 and the 50, uh, assuming that number of 50 is the realistic development potential, the ways that that is met in terms of a housing plan, uh, more often than not, it's done through what's known as inclusionary zoning, which means lands are basically put typically in a multifamily zone at a certain density, uh, and then there's a requirement that somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the total number of units allowed have to be reserved or set aside for affordable housing. That's probably the primary method of meeting the need. Municipalities also have the ability to do 100% uh, affordable projects. So you, they might find a site where they do 24 units and they're all affordable units. It's not a mix of market rate and affordable units. The, the issue there is you have to demonstrate that there's a funding source. You usually try and seek out a nonprofit developer. In some cases, those developers need certain sweeteners, like, you know, the municipality has to put up the land. They very often seek highly competitive tax credit financing. So they're difficult, uh, much more difficult than inclusionary zoning, but they're very often part of a municipality's housing plan. Assisted living units. Actually, there's a state requirement that 10 percent of the beds be basically reserved for Medicaid. Uh, patients, that counts towards the affordable housing obligation. That's another opportunity. Supportive housing, uh, housing for individuals with developmental disabilities, that also can count towards uh, your fair share housing plan. So those are the typical mechanisms that would be in a plan to meet your number. And then for the unmet need, it's typically done through some type of, uh, of overlay zoning uh, uh, on certain lands within the municipality. So, 
I think that gives you some flavor for where we are now. Still don't have any indication of what the number is, but uh, I think we've kind of brought it to, uh, to some extent to deal with uh, the situation in Milburn where, quite frankly, there are, are not a lot of vacant land resources to meet whatever that number ultimately is. Good. Thank you. Um, we hope uh, earnestly that notwithstanding the fog of all of that and the volume of it, that we've managed to explain in a fundamental way what has been going on in this state for these decades and where we stand now with respect to affordable housing going forward and the, and the challenges related to it. So I will move next to the, um, we've got a little time left here. If you want to have a question uh, to pose, uh, please come up and uh, to this podium, it'll record it. They're making a video of this event and they need to get you on the recording. Which you could purchase as you go out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tremendously basic question here. What's the definition of affordable? Uh, I can take it, Ed. I, I'll start. Um, it, it's uh, twofold. You need to look at uh, the underlying question is what's a low and moderate income household? Mm -hmm. uh, a low and moderate income household, a moderate income household uh, earns uh, between 50 and 80 percent of the median income in the region for the same family size. Mm -hmm. uh, a low income uh, family uh, earns less than 50% mm -hmm. of the median income. Okay. Um, the, uh, afford the price and or rents of units that these families can uh, occupy are based upon that income. And I can't tell you, and maybe Paul can, can give you a better uh, grip on this, I can't tell you the actual methodology they use, but it's generally tied to what a family, depending on family size, uh, can afford either in purchase or rent if they were spending, <clears throat> I believe it's no more than 30% right. of their income if it's a sales That's unit correct. and 28% of their income uh, if it's a rental unit or vice versa, 30% of right. it's rental and mm -hmm. 28% if it's sales. And that's, that amount is then projected into mortgage payments, which mm -hmm. are based upon interest rates at any given time, with a, I believe, a 5% down payment. And you figure out what the price of the house would be. And that number, how that, however that's calculated, which changes in regions, obviously. Right. Uh, but that's the number that that developer, let's say, who has an inclusionary project must sell that affordable unit for. And the obligation of developers is to provide 50% of those units, avail make them available for low-income families, and 50% of them for moderate-income families, which is the 50 to 80%. So he's got to do all of that. Uh, and actually, there's another requirement that's even lower than that that he's got to satisfy as well. But that's, that's generally it. I, 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 can't, I don't know uh, offhand what the, what a, you know, a, an, an average price, let's say, for a, a house, a, a moderate income of four, moderate income household consisting of four persons uh, is. I would venture to say it's in the 130 to $150,000 range. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It's probably the order of magnitude. And by the way, just to the, as Ed mentioned, it's that, that median is based on the median in the region. Correct. And uh, Milburn is within Essex County, which is region two, and Essex is put together with um, Union, Mars, and Warren now. Right. Yeah. Correct. So the, that's what the, the region is, and the area-wide median is based on that region. The other thing to consider is there's requirements with regard to the uh, bedroom distribution 
of the units that to, uh, it has to be a combination of ones, twos, and three bedroom units mm -hmm. for the affordable units. And it generally works out based on the code rules that generally it's 20% ones, 20% threes, and 60% twos. That's mm -hmm. generally how it work comes out. Is there any affordable housing in Milburn Township? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Well, there, there may be, but the issue is um, basically in terms of qualifying today, there's uh, requirements with regard to those units being deed restricted for a certain period of time. And that would be re a requirement uh, with regard to any affordable housing plan mm -hmm. put together moving forward. That's not to say there aren't potentially units that are on the market right now that would fall within those ranges mm -hmm. based on the COA calculations, but I would seriously doubt that we have deed restricted units out in the, the market at this point, but there actually potentially could be units where affordable uh, families or households would basically be paying rent at those levels, but again, they're not deed restricted for right. 20 or 30 years into the, into the future. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, you used a term environmentally constrained, and I'd like for you to elaborate on that in the context of my question. To take an extreme example, I would imagine you couldn't put affordable housing on the Kim Buck landfill or on the PJP landfill, even though it's open space I would, in my mind, that land would be environmentally constrained by extreme contamination. So what I'm wondering is, are there other environmental conditions that might prevent the construction of affordable housing on a site? And as I mentioned during a, a town meeting, we know that the proposed site of housing on Chatham Road is within a certain number of feet of a stream that runs through the Arboretum. And way back in, in what seems like another lifetime, I used to work for DEP, Bureau of Stream Encroachment. And there were many um, limitations on what you could do within X feet of a stream. And I'm wondering if any of you have had any experience in um, prevailing against builders on the grounds that, to use your term, a site is environmentally constrained because of a stream, or we also have a former gas station on the proposed site, and I understand that there is some groundwater contamination. Um, could that likewise be deemed a condition that environmentally constrains a site? And could you speak to that? Shall I take a shot at this? Okay. Yes. So there are, I think, two separate ways to look at and the way to answer your question. Uh, one relates to the issue of a municipality inventorying its vacant land resources, which is sort of a theoretical exercise to come up with a number. And then there are the particulars of any prospective individual development site. So let me go through the first. Under the code rules, let's say when we're calculating vacant land resources that we have a, a and again this is just for argument's sake, there's a large piece of property that's 50 acres out there. I don't think that exists in Milburn, but let's just do it for argument's sake. Um, basically, based on the code rules, uh, the municipality has the ability to look at uh, whether there are wetlands on that site. And let's face it, not all sites do we have delineation, so we use generalized maps such as the DEP maps to get some indication. We can exclude those portions of the site that are designated as wetlands. Out it goes. from the from from the vacant land inventory. Steep slopes, slopes over 15%, out it goes. Floodplains, out it goes. So let's say on that 50 acre site that those three environmental constraints took up 40 acres, right? You'd have 10 acres left that would have to count towards your vacant land inventory. 
So that's the way it works sort of in theory. In practice, now you talked about whether or not a landfill poses uh, constraints and remediation issues. They're all sort of site specific. Um, certainly there are challenges with a the landfill. There's issues with closure. There's issues, environmental issues with residential uh, in terms of sites that um, have been contaminated. What's the level of remediation? Have they basically taken the soils away? Have they uh, uh, basically, are they capping the site? These are all issues that really relate to an individual site and an individual development project. Stream bu riparian buffers. A riparian buffer of 500 feet can kill a project. And quite frankly, any developer is subject to the rules that exist. And there are NJDEP rules with regard to developing within these buffers, developing within flood hazard areas, uh, putting fill within the floodway fringe. These are all things that basically a prospective developer would have to comply with. Uh, and certainly that might uh, potentially eliminate a site that might otherwise be considered. So it's all fact specific and circumstance specific with regard to a particular site. Okay, now I have another question for you. Can there be an overlay of low income housing with senior housing? In other words, if let's say that Milburn were faced with some kind of builder's remedy lawsuit and you're trying to negotiate your way out of it. Can, can you fulfill your low income housing requirement by requiring that the low income housing that's built be designated as senior housing? Only 25% of it. Okay, because the, re the reason why I'm asking is if there is more housing built, especially in the Glenwood section, my kids went to Glenwood, that school is at max. We're, we're talking trailers on site. And it can't hold another kid. So that's why I'm, yeah. I'm trying to find out if, if Milburn were backed into a corner, could they could they meet their constitutional obligation while limiting the population of school children and sort of kill two birds with one stone? So the answer is you have 25% 25 25 is the best the you can do. The could be reserved for age-restricted or senior housing. Is the Milburn Planning Board currently looking at developing the master plan in such a way as to mandate that senior housing be uh, be built in certain areas. We don't know that. Well, I don't. Know yeah, do. all, I don't all I can tell you is is the Milburn Planning Board is about to undertake a reexamination of its master plan, which is is required, as Ed mentioned, to do every ten years. The last reexamination was 2008. You can do the math. The, the, the municipality is going to be required to basically, the planning board, adopt the reexamination by December of 2018. And I know that the planning board is moving forward with undertaking that reexamination report. So whether or not it gets to that issue, I don't know, but they are undertaking a reexamination. Okay, finally, I'd like to talk about the interplay of low income housing and local building codes. In order, I'm imagining that I'm sitting in a developer's shoes and I want to put up low income housing. And because I have to sell this at below market rates, and because I want to make a profit, I want to cut corners on the quality of materials that I use. Can Milburn essentially box out a builder seeking to put in low income housing by beefing up its building code and requiring that higher standards be satisfied and um, basically do an end run around affordable housing by saying, yeah, you can build affordable housing but you know you have to use uh, steel I beams instead of uh, you know wooden um, 
joist or you know whatever the main support network in a house is called you've got to use steel i beams you can't use wood or you 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 uh, have to use uh, you know green board throughout instead of just regular drywall because we want to make sure that there's no mold problem in our housing and make it uniform across the board so that any new construction has got to comply with this and uh, it's not that you're it's not that you're trying to at least facially uh, box out low-income housing but you're making it so difficult to uh, for, for a builder to meet his profit margin that you effectively uh, discourage people like the, the guys that want to come in and develop the Chatham Road, Road site. Can you do that? No. Why not? <laughs> the, the building code of Milburn is the state uniform. Yeah, it's BOCA, right? You're going code. by BOCA. Yes. You don't have the but can't option you exceed BOCA? to say, oh, well, build it with granite instead of, you know, Michael. normal <laughs> for micro or whatever. <laughs> if it, uh, I mean, I you know have to commend but your please, ingenuity, but everybody would have done that. A, I'm sorry to box out affordable housing if it were simply a, a matter of uh, changing the construction code. But that's not. But isn't the construction code uh, a, a floor and not a ceiling? In other words, you have to meet these minimum standards. Can't the municipality say we want to we want to make our housing better? We want to make we want to ensure our residents don't burn up in a fire we want to you know we want to increase the firewall requirement between floors etc cetera, etc cetera, and make it even better well better is in the eye of the beholder i think a court might say wait a minute milburn you're rigging your construction code so as to actually deny the very people who are trying to provide for low and moderate income housing the opportunity to have it by putting extraordinary, you know, steel instead of wood where it would be normally and acceptably so, uh, allowed. Hey, it's just an idea. Oh, I know, I know. Well, it's a good question. <laughs> Trying to be creative here. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. This, is, um, this has been fascinating and very, very long and involved, but uh, but it's quite a story. The one thing that fascinates me in it is the builder's remedy lawsuits. Um, and I don't know much about them, though the little I've read is that they're based on uh, a combination of using the affordable housing as a leverage, but basing it on um, return on investment. That is to say, the builder has to be able to afford to do this and make a reasonable profit. Is that? Is that correct? Am I correct in understanding that? Uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, the, the builder's remedy lawsuit that Kit talked about uh, that the Supreme Court uh, uh, effectively established in Mount Laurel II uh, allowed a, let me, let me step back for a second. Typically, if a uh, property owner challenges the zoning that is on his or her property. Uh, they have to challenge it based upon the fact that, for example, it's inconsistent with the master plan, that it, they've zoned the property into inutility or that kind of thing. Uh, he or she cannot, prior to the builder's remedy, could not sue and say, I want a hotel zoning on my property. He can only challenge the zoning that was on there, but could not dictate what the zoning would be. Therefore, when you got into the affordable housing field, a developer who was assembling property only had the ability to challenge the zoning that was on there. So he may challenge and say there shouldn't be you know, 20,000 square foot lots there. Uh, there's something wrong with that. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, what the Builder's Remedy did was to say, if a developer can demonstrate that a municipality has not satisfied its constitutional obligation, it, the developer, can get site-specific relief to assist in, develop, in satisfying that obligation. So it gave 
the developers uh, a hammer to hold over a municipality, and if a municipality was not, did not have the plan, did not go through the administrative process or now the judicial process, it could now, a developer can come in and say, I have this property, you have not satisfied your constitutional obligation, and I want this property zoned for multifamily housing at 30 units to an acre, and I will set aside 20% of those units for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. That's the way the, the, the yeah. process the works. The bonus for the developer is that the developer gets many more units than would have been permitted under the existing zone. Well, well right, the developer That's has to make money. Yeah. And by adding the units on, he's able to make the money, because he's not making the money on the affordable That's units. Correct. So he has to have, it has to be a combination of affordable and something else. It could be multi-use as well, couldn't it? It could be affordable units plus something else which generates revenue. And that would make the developer enough money to make the, the project worthwhile, right? In theory. In theory. Right. Yeah, in, in theory. theory. Yes. Well, it's, it's interesting though, I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen a non-residential development coming in to try to increase a floor area ratio or, you know. Well, no, but it would have the affordable housing portion. It would be a multi-use. It would be the affordable housing in addition to, I don't know, stores or something else. Well, you do have projects, um, uh, uh, mixed use developments yeah. all yeah. over that are, uh, yes, that's true. Okay, all right, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, thank you so much for doing this. It actually was not as um, head exploding as you may have thought it was. I think you guys did a really good job of distilling a lot of information into um, a short period of time and making it somewhat intelligible for, for lay people in the audience. So I, I really do appreciate it. I think it has paid off more than you even realize, so, so thank, thank you. you. Um, I also want to say that um, this issue for me is not about affordable housing. This is issue for me, and I think some other people here, is more about density. Um, I think if people have an opportunity to utilize some of the resources that we have available in this town, you know, more power to them. It really is a density issue for me, so I just wanted to put that on the table. Um, but, but what I wanted to ask about is if you could really talk a little bit more about what about the special master and about the factors that um, a special master uses to make decisions in these builder remedies because um, that seems to be who's made out to be the, the bogeyman in some ways or woman. Um, so if you could talk about that a little bit, I, I would really appreciate that. You or me? <laughs> no, I, I have actually, I've been asked by four judges and I've declined in every case. I have no interest in being the special master, but well, you know let me start. Do. Oh, I and, definitely and know gonna, what they do. I'm going to pass it to okay. Paul because he really, he really deals with that. Um, uh, the, the role of the special master is, is an attempt to uh, ensure that the municipality satisfies its constitutional affordable housing obligation. So his or her view is site-specific in a builder's remedy case, but also broader than that because in the end, remember the developer came in and said the municipality has not satisfied its constitutional obligation and therefore it's got to satisfy it. So the municipality, in, in addition to dealing with that site-specific development, has to now deal with the bigger issue of the overall obligation. And that's one perspective from which the special master comes at it. I'm gonna pass it to Paul because he's dealt with them on a uh, much, much more direct basis. So the special master is really the court's expert. Uh, it's the, it, the special master is to advise the judge on a municipality's ability to prepare a, a complying plan uh, that meets or seeks to meet the fair share housing number. And if there is a builder's remedy suit or a DJ action, as Ed described, 
the special master also serves sort of as a mediator between the parties. So there may be an intervener who's interested in uh, basically uh, pursuing a uh, inclusionary development on a site, and very often the intervener is looking for a higher density than what the municipality may be willing to accept. Uh, and uh, there are issues that the uh, special master has to deal with in terms of site suitability. And by site suitability, I'm also talking about the suitability of a site for a particular development or density of development. And, and this all has to be weighed in also with whatever the municipal's ultimate obligation is. And by that I mean if a municipality has a relatively high obligation, doesn't have a lot of land resources, and there's a developer at the table, that developer will argue that, well, I deserve a higher density because I can take a bigger chunk out of this number which you can't otherwise meet. And the court appointed master has to mediate that. And it has to look at issues such as, well, is, is what that developer proposing compatible with the neighborhood? Um, you know, it's a balancing act, basically, what the court appointed mediator will do. And again, he or she is focused on the overall compliance of the municipality's plan, as well as trying to mediate what's an appropriate um, uh, basic uh, development program for either a builder's remedy litigant or in the case of a municipality which is involved in a declaratory judgment action, uh, a, a intervener in the case who, has st who he or she has standing. Um, and essentially, it, very often, it becomes sort of a battle over density. And, and do, the, do the special masters take a look at what the zoning is, you know, if it's a, gen, do they take that into consideration to a certain degree? They will take that degree. into consideration. They'll look okay. at the existing zoning. Mm -hmm. They'll look at the surrounding land uses. They'll look at recent development patterns in the area. They'll look at issues such as, is this appropriate for higher density? Is it located in a downtown? Does it have access to uh, uh, transit? All those things will be taken into account by the, the master in coming to some conclusion and advising the judge if there's no settlement reached as to what that master thinks is an appropriate development program and density for any individual site okay. and how that fits within compliance as part of an overall plan. Okay, so the, this, the special master is not necessarily going to come down on the builder's side. Theoretically, they're going to take they're going to take into consideration all of the That's the correct. issues that you that you just correct. stated. So, so theoretically, it would not necessarily be a disaster for a town to have a special master come in and intervene and possibly negotiate um, based on what the builder wants and what the town zoning and residential neighborhood is like. For instance, it depends on your point of view. I think. Many might say that the fact that the special master is there doing what he, he or she is doing borders on a calamity because you're going to end up with something uh, that's highly likely to be more densely developed than would otherwise have been permitted under your zoning. Yes, it is a good thing that a fair-minded master fairly negotiates between the parties, but you're in, you know, a bad situation. And if I could just piggyback what Paul mentioned about site suitability is where your issue comes in. That element of whether the site, there's a site suitability analysis done, the case that we're in, in another municipality, um, the, the site is very large, but has pockets of really terrible contamination on it. Now the developer is going to great expense to remediate that site, to bring it up to a standard where it can be developed, but that is an element where the municipality goes back and say, well, for this reason, that reason, other you know, environmental constraints, the standing master ought to take site suitability into consideration when doing the balance that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in, in general, has it been the case that over the years when the special master has come in that the town has done much worse than it would have if it had negotiated something directly with the builder? Has that been borne out? That's tough. Yeah, I think that, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think this, 
The special master in, in a builder's remedy lawsuit <clears throat> um, creates a situation where the municipality loses control because the matter has now been initiated by the developer. And right. you know, you start off sort of behind the eight ball because that site now becomes a priority site. And not all these other things of suitability and environmental constraints, all of that is taken into account. <clears throat> but you tend to be a follower rather than a leader. <clears throat> if a municipality is going to move forward with filing its plan, it gets to select how it's going to satisfy its obligation. And it, it puts it in a different position, just psychologically, I think, and, and in terms of uh, the negotiation process and the mediation process that a special master would have to get involved with because the municipality's taken that first step as opposed to sort of being pulled, kicking and screaming to the court room uh, saying, you know, you're going to have to satisfy your constitutional obligation. And there, that, there's a dynamic there, I think, that is, is something that can't be ignored. Can I, I'm going to add one other thing, and I, I don't mean to be cute, I mean to be serious. It often depends on who the special master oh, is. I'm sure that's true. That. But, but let me just, so, just so I understand, my, my understanding is that we, Milburn Township does not have a plan. Is that correct? Correct. The municipality so, so when you talk about the um, fear that the town would lose control, it seems to me that we've already lost control because the builders are coming in and we don't have a plan. So we've ar we're already behind, you know, we're already at a loss of control. The builders are, it, just as a resident, it appears to me that the builders are already in charge. So from my perspective, I'm not sure why it's so bad if a special master comes in. Um, obviously, it would, I w we would hope it would be the right special master, but it seems to me like the control's gone. We, Matt Cowley went through, now we've got Chatham Road. Word is out. Builders are coming because they know where the township is, I'm, I would guess. They've done their research. So I'm not sure what this idea of we want control is when it seems to me we don't have control. And I don't know if you can speak to that or not. It, it may be a misperception on my part, but, but I'm just wondering if you can speak to that. In fairness, I, I think it, it has to be said it's a fair observation. I don't think we're going to validate or invalidate your particular view of things, okay. but it is certainly one way to look at it. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Um, I tend to agree with what the lady just said. I'm very concerned living in Glenwood. With Glenwood is a quaint little area, small streets, vintage homes. Um, lots of children. How are the new children that coming in going to go to the Glenwood School when it is overcrowded as it is? How are we going to be able to cross the street to go to the train when if you ever drive down that road when the train comes in, it's so dangerous with people crossing back and forth and cars trying to go. How's that going to happen with all these other people, um, new people coming into our town? Are, are they addressing the traffic situation, the dangerous situation that is already there? Uh, and is this a done deal? Do we have anything to say about this? Well, Can you address are, are these? Are you talking about Chatham Road? Yeah. There's no done deal. There's no uh, no. I mean, deal whatsoever. Is this coming in? Is this project actually definitely going to happen? Are they? I can't say that. That, that they made a conceptual presentation to the township of what they would like to do. Uh, I wrote a letter. Oh, I, I, they've made a conceptual presentation to the township of what they want to do. As a matter of fact, I wrote a letter to one of the vice presidents over there last week telling them that I think they really got ahead of themselves with their website 
uh, as if they have this uh, development that's a fait accompli. It's either been uh, approved or they think it's inevitable. But, uh, the, all these decisions have to be made by the elected officials of this community, and uh, nothing of the sort has been decided. And what about the traffic? Well, that's the kind of thing that will have to be taken into consideration down the line uh, as to what, if anything, is going to happen there. But your questions are good ones, but we're in the v very most formative stages of, of analyzing this. And as I said in the beginning, we're really not going to address specific things that are before the township at the present time. Our purpose here is to kind of acquaint everybody with what affordable housing is and what the land use boards do. But uh, as close as I can get to it, I, I would say that that and the kinds of things that you're mentioning are things that the community and the elected representatives of the people are going to have to grapple with mm -hmm. going forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi, and thanks so much for your presentation. I would ask you to speak a little louder because we can't sorry, hear in the yeah. back. But um, I would just like to clarify one thing about the special master, and it, maybe you've answered it and I missed it. My question is this. Um, if, if, as in the Silverstein project, there's a, um, if, if we take that, what's on the website, as um, what, they, what they're planning to do, is your point that the special master might end up deciding on a plan that's less desirable for the Glenwood neighborhood than that? Is that the fear? That's, that's one question. Or in the alternative, are you saying that if you bring in a special master, the whole, ta the whole town's planning, uh, um, affordable housing plan will be controlled by that special master who comes in on a builder's remedy suit for, this, for a specific project such as the Silverstein project. That's my question. I would just like to clarify that. You want to take it? Um, yeah. In regards to your second question, okay. uh, if a builder's remedy lawsuit is mm -hmm. filed, uh, as I said earlier, it is a twofold lawsuit. One is a site-specific aspect of it. That is that that site that the developer has an interest in by contract or ownership or otherwise should be included in the plan. But the second aspect is you have to have a plan to satisfy the entirety of your obligation. You have to remember that these builders remedy lawsuits were endorsed by the Supreme Court because between 1975, <clears throat> when Mount Laurel One came down, and 1983, when the builders remedy lawsuit was validated by the Supreme Court. Nothing was happening because municipalities were, despite what was said in 1975, were ignoring their responsibility. The court was at, in their mind, wit's end because nothing was happening, the legislature wasn't doing anything, and they needed somebody to pick up the ball and force municipalities to satisfy their constitutional obligation. Ergo, the builder's remedy came into vogue <clears throat> and was validated by the Supreme Court to say to builders, we want you to bring those lawsuits to force municipalities, not only to force municipalities to satisfy their constitutional obligation. And as a carrot, as a bonus to you, we're going to give you the right to have your property rezoned to be included in that plan. So now you have an incentive. You buy property that's zoned at one acre as a minimum lot size, and we'll give you 28, uh, 20 units per acre. Well, that's a pretty good incentive have a, have a for 52. developers <laughs> to come in <laughs> or and say, okay, 82. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm not really concerned about the constitutional obligation, but if I have to do that, I'll do it because I'll get in return what I want. And that was the, the, the mm. builders and developers are used as pawns by the Supreme Court to bring these lawsuits. And so, yes, the answer to your second question is, it's not only the site, mm -hmm. it's Everything. the whole thing is open. The whole town. So, it, 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 so, unless the town, if the town has a plan, then the town has adopted a plan, then the town is not nearly as susceptible 
to a builder's remedy lawsuit. Is that right? There's near. Um, if, the, if the town adopts a plan and it gets what's known as substantive certification, now in the courts it will be a judgment of compliance. They are essentially protected, protected. against builder remedy lawsuits and, for a 10 year period. And is there, I don't, I'm not sure about the, the time framing of this. Um, does, the, does the builder get to keep suing um, if, if the town adopts a plan subsequent, subsequent to when the suit is brought or, or the builder can bring the suit in while it's, this, this would take time to go through the courts. While it's going through the courts, the town adopts a plan and then the builder doesn't necessarily, doesn't lose, then the builder loses clout? Uh, the builder who, br who brings a builder's remedy lawsuit uh, and is successful in, in having a court determine that the municipality has not satisfied its constitutional obligation has essentially established his right to a rezoning of his property. But my question is, does the yeah, town the have town, to have a plan in place before the builder builds the, brings yeah. the lawsuit? Oh. Beforehand, has, the town has an approved plan? Does, does that have to be the situation, or is it that? The township needs a judgment of compliance from the court in order to have the protection. In order to have the protection. And how long does something like that take? Like if our town decided that it wanted to get a plan and, and, and <clears throat> obtain this judgment of compliance, how long would that take Re it, normally? Or if they wanted to do it as fast as they could? The, the, the plan itself isn't what takes the time. It's, it's going through the courts. So, I mean, you know, you got to get through the Essex County court system on these. And I, I defer to Ed, uh, preparing the plan is, you know, it has to go through, you know, the planning board has to adopt the housing element and fair share and has to put it together. Uh, and then the governing body has to basically agree to basically send that plan as, as its plan to comply. Uh, to the courts, so the, the preparation of the plan itself, you know, can be done within months. Uh -huh. It's a question of how long it takes to get through the courts, and I'm, I'm going to defer to Ed, who I know can't answer the question, but he can still do it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> we got to have, <laughs> have a plan. We got to have a plan. You like that, hey? I can't. I can't do that. <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, it's not a short process. Mm -hmm. um, and can the builder get his remedy while this is taking place? Uh, um, if the, town, if the municipality files the plan yeah, wouldn't that before help? a builder's remedy lawsuit is filed, uh, the town would seek temporary immunity from builder remedy lawsuits. Uh, that does not mean to say that a, that a builder would not be able to participate in the process, mm -hmm. uh, but typically they are prevented from then bringing a builder's remedy lawsuit because remember the purpose of the builder's mm -hmm. remedy lawsuit is Gets to plan. force the town to do what it's done. If it's already done that, there's no reason for mm -hmm. the developer to be able to exercise that remedy. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. We'll take this last one and then we're exceeding our uh, rental of the room, I think. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I had uh, brought up a case at the township committee recently, Upper Saddle River versus Matt Cali. And um, because we were talking about the negativity of, or the sense was the negativity of, of going into suit. And I had heard that the uh, mayor of the town had asked the residents what they wanted to do when Matt Cali came and um, wanted to turn the per, uh, Pearson education um, building um, and and uh, and build on that property, and they agreed to uh, you know go into suit because I, I imagine Matt Cali threatened them with a builder's remedy. And the outcome, from what I could ascertain, is that Matt Cali originally wanted to build 564 rentals at One Lake Street. They ended up building 208 luxury residents at the former Pearson Educational uh, Facility. And um, they also reached an agreement that the town would uh, get 3.2 million in taxes instead of the 
973,000. This included affordable houses, 22 affordable units on the Pearson site, and 25 on the borough-owned property. And um, Upper Saddle River would acquire nine acres from the Pearson Education property. So they, it's, it appeared like they came out okay. They were sued in federal and state court, but they were able to um, benefit from it, I think. And I heard that you were part of that case, Mr. Bruzak. I was. Okay. I am. You still are? I am. Okay. Mr. Falcon had said you would shed some light on it. <laughs> Anything further? <laughs> Start shedding. <laughs> he didn't tell me that oh. before today. <laughs> um, oh well. You're right. There were there were uh, there was a builder's remedy lawsuit that was brought in state court. There was a federal court suit brought as well. Uh, the settlement that you outlined is generally correct in, in terms of of the the outcome of it. Um, but, uh, and this goes to some of the earlier questions that were asked, um, that, that uh, matter is still in court because while we've satisfied a portion of the obligation, the number of which we don't know yet because we're in the same situation in Upper right. Saddle River as we are here and every place else in the state, <clears throat> uh, we're still trying to figure out how we satisfy the balance of the obligation that we have. So that case is still going on. Uh, we're, we're working on this, the vacant land adjustment that Paul was talking about uh, in Upper Saddle River because we have the same situation there, albeit much larger lots, but nonetheless, very little vacant land available. Um, and, and it's ongoing, but the numbers for Upper Saddle River are uh, high and um, uh, actually, as opposed to the general norm where I said fair shares numbers are high, the municipal number is low from the municipal expert, and the Reading number, the court appointed master in some other counties is in the middle. In Upper Saddle River, the difference between the special master's number and the municipal number is extremely small. It's, it's two or three or five units. So there's not, there's not a lot of difference between those two. There's a bigger difference between those numbers and the fair share number, but not, uh, not between the other ones. So uh, Upper Saddle River's got a large number to attempt to satisfy and, and we're trying to do that but there'll be a large unmet need i'm sure but they did it appears that they did okay going from 564 rentals to uh to 208 luxury uh homes. <coughs> well office out of Urban had also instituted a, a program back from 1998 where they began to assemble property and purchase property for an inventory that they would utilize to uh, satisfy right. its affordable housing obligation. And the 25 units that you were talking about that are off-site right. uh, are being built on land that the borough of Upper Saddle River owns that they had acquired for these purposes. So they had been doing this for a while? They've been doing in it, planning since, on it Yes, since okay. the late 90s. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, I know the number and I think it's public. I think, and I've lost track of years, 2015, 16, June, each city, town, and the state needed to submit to the Affordable Housing Council their count, their number for what they suggested would be their requirement. Uh, I'm not sure I'm following. Did not each city have to submit a housing count of what they thought their affordable housing low-income requirement would be? 
Didn't that occur in? Well, municipalities by July 8th of 2015 right. had to file a declaratory judgment action, which would take the plan that they had before COA right. and effectively transfer it to the court. So whatever numbers they had utilized in that plan were the numbers that at least initially they filed with the court. So there is a public number submitted from each town city in the state of New Jersey. No, no, those were the towns that had them pending. Right. Melbourne did not have to submit no, no. a number? The, the, For those towns the that towns were not. That had a, an application pending, then those were the ones that got transferred. The towns that had applications pending. Not you. I think your question was, does every municipality in New Jersey have to have submitted a number? That, to that was my understanding, no? No. No. Just the cities that have submitted and participated, by example, Livingston has participated in the program you know, some 20 plus years ago. Garden State Homes, you know, Livingston had no apartments. Uh, the first you know, of the developers remedy lawsuits in this area was across from the Livingston Mall. So Livingston over a period of time, including now, is still participating, you know, 10%, 15%. South Orange is participating. I went to a planning board uh, meeting there last week or two weeks ago, um, including some 10% of a project of 108 units. Funding, and, and we're going with this, is hopefully somewhere that maybe will help the Short Hills neighborhood of a contribution of dollars in lieu of an additional 10%. South Orange is wishing to contribute up to 20% instead of 15%. The question I'm trying to lead to is, assuming for the moment that the Silverman Group is successful or hoping to be successful in a developer's remedy lawsuit or in negotiating with the town similar to Mac Cali and ending up with something less than 600 apartments and perhaps with uh, hotel rooms and apartments in that particular case, is it possible on Chatham Road to work with the developer to have them participate in accepting a contribution in kind towards some future project, whether, as you mentioned, Paul, to have 24 units somewhere else in town, whether it's at the recycling yard, whether it's on Willow Street, whether it's in the downtown parking lots, does it need to be there? Can we participate and resist a developer's remedy lawsuit and perhaps take dollars to pay for that 15% of the units and have that done somewhere else? I, I, I'm, I'm not, a lot, uh, I don't want to get involved in any site-specific uh, matters because I'm not familiar with... with then it's more for KIT than for town planner is... Again, I'm, I'm introducing this in the public domain because it seems to be so quiet in the public domain. Uh, there's a certain outgoing township councilman who has suggested in the public domain that Milburn has done a wonderful job of kicking the can down the road. Well, the road is coming to an end and there's going to be a resolution of this issue and property is disappearing in town. A further five acre piece of property for 20 years you know, we've tried to get the town to look at the, you know, known as the turf grass property, is gone. Um, the Mac Cali property, for better or for worse, it, it, it's gone, that portion of it. The, there's other areas. The, the question is, we need to be business savvy and how we can accommodate not only schools to be compliant. I last year got a project approved in Livingston with uh, a sunrise with 10 uh, percent you know, affordable. Uh, it's now held up in the courts for different reasons, but it's going to ultimately be approved. But there's many different ways to skin this cat. And I know, certainly, Kit, behind the scenes, I'm not privy to you know, any of those specific discussions, but I am in, in other towns. We need to be more proactive. We need not to have, I'm, I'm a developer, I'm not a residential developer, though I have a project perhaps pending up in West Orange right now. And the towns are under attack because further, as you've all mentioned, historically housing booms and busts, and maybe another one will come soon. But in the interim, everybody wants to build residential. And I can tell you, Bleecker and Willow Street, in, in town right now are hot grounds for you know, developers. There, there's properties for sale and there's others that are being pursued. I don't wish as a resident, I wear a different hat as a developer, but we should be controlling our destiny to the extent that we can. It's a very perilous and a difficult, and you are three of the more prominent people you know, in the state of New Jersey just from my readings of things going on. And here in listening to you, 
there, there's no firm you know, statement that you can make as to you know the quantity of units, the location of the units, as to the the mediator, and you know that's you know this discomforting. What we perhaps can control is where you know this development is going to occur. I'm concerned that the property, a house on Old Short Hills Road that's been for sale for a number of years on Jefferson and Old Short Hills Road. Developer, hey, I could be interested coming out of this meeting tonight to go put that property under contract and say, hey, I'm going to put 120 residential units on a busy road. There's plenty of busier roads than that than Essex County, Morris County with residential buildings all over the place. We are at risk. And a township committeeman is thrown out of office tonight by a substantial margin. And to this public, you know, we, we community need to answer to the mayor who is here, who's, who's just, for those who don't, is re-elected to, to the township committee with another new person. We need to be responsive. I know you respond to the people who, you know, run the town and aren't here to respond, you know, to the public directly as to how you do perform, but it is something we are leaving ourselves significantly in the risk of having something in a location. There's a five acre piece of land on Montview. It's a significant residential property in a significant residential area, but it's five acres. If it's 10 acres, 15, when does that take away, you know, the residential character if a property is large enough? So uh, I think you're making very strong arguments to be proactive and to do a plan, if I'm hearing you correctly. We, at the minimum, need to do a plan and address this as aggressively as we can while pending you know, what's out there in, in the public domain. But please don't wait for another, you know, it's been implied and suggested by, by elsewhere. There's going to be another, and it's coming soon. Right. I happen to know of one particular piece of property. It's not me, and it's going to be coming in front of the town. If it isn't already, I, I can't speak for, you know, the mayor, but it's coming. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we appreciate your steadfast hanging in these couple of hours, and uh, we all look forward to coming events in this regard. Thank you very much.